So yeah, so as Alex said today, I'm going to talk more uh, about the clinical side. I've done a lot of genetics and genome biology, um, but I've moved over to clinical data. And so today I'm going to talk about clinical prediction for prenatal hydronephrosis uh, using only renal ultrasounds. So currently, uh, prenatal hydronephrosis has a, a pretty standard management. Um, and it's a bit non-standard, though, in how it actually goes down. So <clears throat> in general, this, uh, this is detected prenatally. And hydronephrosis is uh, a dilatation of the kidneys. So basically what they see is a baby in utero that has dilated kidneys or big kidneys filled with fluid. Um, and so once baby is born, then they tell the parents, like, once your kid is born, you need to come for follow-up visits to the hospital. So uh, they're going to come to a pediatric hospital and get repeated ultrasounds. They're also going to tend to get invasive tests, uh, like a functional renogram or a DMSA, to assess uh, the function of the kidney, whether or not there's reflux. So reflux is when uh, urine from the bladder is being pushed back up into the kidneys. Um, and so all of these things need to be done repeatedly over time with invasive tests. It's timely, it's uncertain, and everyone's um, kind of threshold for surgery is a bit different. So after all of this, uh, which takes is 30% of urology clinic volumes, 43% uh, of those kids are getting a functional renogram, so an invasive test to assess function, yet less than half are going on to surgery. So a lot of kids who aren't getting surgery are getting invasive testing, and all the kids are getting these repeated ultrasounds, repeated tests. Um, and so what we wanted to do was build a non-invasive tool to stratify patients more efficiently. Uh, we want to cut down on ultrasounds, uh, like the numbers, so kids are getting between 2 and 10. Um, before surgery or, or to determine surgery, um, and also to cut down for the need of invasive tests, particularly in the lower acuity kids, uh, where you might save them an exposure to radiation or catheterization when they're below the age of two. Um, so one way that we did this was um, using a neural network. So we took ultrasound stills uh, from the full ultrasound. Uh, so in particular, a sagittal and a transverse view you see there. Um, and then we built a, a Siamese neural network uh, to predict the probability that that kidney would receive surgery, the probability that kidney is, has reflux, so we looked at both kidneys, uh, each kidney separately, um, and then we assessed to what degree either view is actually offering information. So we looked at a model with only one view, uh, only sagittal, and another model with only transverse view. Um, so here's what we found for our surgery and reflux models. Um, so we found that in general, uh, we do a great, a better job predicting with sagittal and transverse view. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have all the confidence intervals ready to go, so I removed them all. What I will say for surgery, for surgical prediction, which we do better in than we do for reflux prediction, um, we find that these are not significantly different uh, in terms of their clinical, uh, in terms of their predictive accuracy here. So this is the area under the um, uh, recall curve, and they're, uh, yeah, so these are not significantly different from each other. Um, however, in reflux, we don't have the confidence intervals yet, but I can imagine that these may be. Uh, however, we built our reflux model with uh, the same individuals that we built our surgery model with, and in general, we only included a subset of refluxers in that model. So we have reason to believe that once we add another set of patients into this model, we'll actually improve because uh, it will include symptomatic and asymptomatic refluxers. Currently, it's primarily asymptomatic refluxers in this data set. Um, and so just to move in quickly to how uh, this would be used in practice and then um, how we've done, uh, dealt with our function prediction, um, basically we thought it would be great if you come in, you get an ultrasound, based on that ultrasound, the probabilities output, maybe you say come back for an ultrasound far in the future. So in general it's going to be three or six months, but maybe when you have a probability of surgery of 0.1, you say don't come back for an ultrasound. You know, know that you have hydronephrosis, go to an emergency department if you get a UTI or some other uh, clinical factor that is going to put you at higher risk for complications, um, and then completely avoid the rest of this clinical course. However, if you have surgery, uh, like a probability of surgery around 0.9, for example, or you have a high probability of reflux, something that the team 
decides it merits surgery along with the other information that they have, then they may be able to actually rush the patients to surgery. And one thing that's uh, been kind of discussed, at least uh, on our side uh, with the clinicians, is that even this delay to surgery, so having to go through these steps before you get to surgery, could actually be compromising the kidney function. So you could be losing kidney function across that time, and actually doing surgery earlier would uh, retain some of that function that you otherwise would be losing. Um, so we're hoping that as we build the accuracy of this, this is not actually be expediting surgery in some of these cases. Um, and now to talk about predicting kidney function. So I, I put Marta's picture here, but she's actually involved in all of this, though she really shouldered the function uh, prediction. So I, I wanted to really feature her there. So uh, function is evaluated in the clinic um, in a way that, uh, or, or it's expressed in the clinic in a, um, a fraction uh, of between two kidneys. So you'll get a function value. So here, these are between zero and 100. Uh, you'll get a function value between zero and 100, and the other kidney is going to be 100 minus that value. So you'll have a value of 50, 50, 40, 60, 60, 40, et cetera. Um, so function that is above 60 or below 40 is bad, uh, but function within those values is okay. So uh, what Marta did was she built a quadrinies, I guess, or like a, a model where you're taking in both the left and the right side uh, views of the kidney as and sagittal and transverse into the model and predicting what's the probability of effectively dysfunction. Um, and so what she found for this model is, again, we cut the transverse out and the sagittal out as well, um, that we do a better job with sagittal and transverse here, and we can do a pretty good job so far, but again, uh, we'd like to add data to this uh, to really improve our method, or our model. Um, so a lot of people talk about these deep learning models on images as if they're black boxes, and while that's true in part, um, we think that using things like uh, gradient-based class activation maps can really help uh, hone in on what was important for that prediction. So um, what we find, for example, is uh, we've got a severe hydronephrosis case, and this one was predicted to have surgery. Uh, it's highlighting uh, a lot of area around the parenchyma and the huge dilatation of the kidney. Um, so in, in one way, <clears throat> pardon me, in one way, this is really just helpful for the, uh, who, either the clinician or ourselves to evaluate, is this even looking at something that's relevant? For example, if it's just highlighting the bottom of the image and it's saying 90% likelihood of surgery, I'm likely not going to believe that. So the fact that it is even highlighting relevant areas of the kidney, uh, we think is really useful. Um, for quality control even alone. Um, but what's nice is you can also compare it to a severe, another severe hydronephrosis case. So both of these are grade four, um, but one that didn't get surgery. And you can see where it's focusing on uh, other areas that uh, are very important for this. So this is the ureter that it's actually highlighting and it's showing that there's not an, uh, a dilated ureter on top of the dilated kidney. So that's important. And then it's also, again, highlighting the parenchyma that's still intact and the pyramid structures that are still intact in the kidney. So it's reasonable what it's highlighting uh, relative to the predictions it's making. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got a lot of future work uh, in mind for this project. So uh, first off is adding more data. So right now we select two stills that we think are best. And in general, these are the closest to the caliper stills. So these are the stills uh, on the ultrasound that are used for measurements of the kidney. So we think that that's reasonable, um, but we also would like, because uh, an ultrasound is kind of a low frame rate video, we'd like to add more stills of the same, uh, so a sagittal view. There's many uh, stills of a sagittal view of the kidney. It would be great to add those into the model and maybe they can act as a kind of regularization or add robustness uh, to our model. Um, we also are going to be, uh, we are actually integrating uh, the predictions over time. So because the patients are having repeated visits, it doesn't make sense to make a completely new prediction and, and remove every past experience with them. Um, and so we're building an LSTM layer into our uh, existing network. Um, also, uh, it's been shown that using um, uh, image, like going image to image or adding multiple tasks to your model can actually improve it. Um, and so one thing we want to show, uh, or what we want to try is, so this is a, a DMSA. This is actually what is used to assess function. Uh, and it's a 3D image. So we are thinking that it might be really useful to actually predict that image itself and see if we can boost our function prediction by predicting the thing that function is derived from. 
Um, so that's an additional step that we'll be taking. Um, we are also working with other hospitals to test our algorithm outside uh, the single site that this was developed and tested in. Um, and finally, we're actually building an app uh, to enable that testing in other sites. So just to be clear, this isn't clinical testing. This just helps clinical people test our algorithm more efficiently. So just do it more rapidly. Um, we found that a lot of <laughs> clinical collaborators struggle with writing code or even executing command line. Um, so having a, a GUI uh, interface or a GUI uh, is helpful for uh, more rapid testing of our algorithm and, and even just updates, uh, pushing updates to them. Um, so this is by no means my own my own work alone here. Uh, I work with a full team. So we've got uh, the Division of Urology at SickKids, uh, Dr. Armando, Armando Lorenzo, and Mandy Rickard, actually the nurse practitioner, uh, built the whole database of patients uh, that we're working with. So uh, she's really driven this project forward. Uh, of course, my supervisor, Anna Goldenberg, and then Michael Bruno is uh, leading the uh, app development as well. And of course, as I mentioned, Marta Scretta has been uh, instrumental in all of this work. Um, so thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions.